Shalom, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well today. Uh, my name is Tony Pino, and I'm here with uh, Mitch Chapman. And it is a uh, time for another Jew and Gentile discussion. And today we're going to be doing a Jew and Gentile discuss Hebrews chapter four. Uh, a little while back, uh, me and brother Mitch uh, were talking about our next topic and uh, we always want to keep things relevant to what is being talked a lot about today. And so when uh, followers of Torah are engaging with a lot of Western Christians in uh, conversation, one of the things always comes up is, you know, should we be following the Torah today? Should we be uh, following the law of Moshe? Has it been abolished? And so the book of Hebrews is one of the most places that people will take you to say, no, we don't have to worry about all that you know, law of Moses stuff. We just have to do the moral law of the law of Moses. Everything else, the civil and the uh, ceremonial, that's all been nailed to the cross. And so we want to go ahead and walk you through several chapters here in the book of Hebrews to show that a consistent look at these chapters does not support that view. Uh, and so we did chapter three last time, and this will be episode 18. And we're going to be diving into chapter four, which these couple chapters that we're on right now are definitely surrounding uh, the idea of Shabbat and pointing back to, of course, the desert experience of the salvation by grace that came to Israel in the mixed multitude uh, upon leaving Egypt and then coming to Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah. Uh, receiving their uh, wedding contract there as they engaged in a wedding covenant. Uh, but everything that we begin to look at when your theology uh, or your interpretation of the Bible, if it contradicts the Torah or the Tanakh, all right, it's obviously not the scriptures that are wrong, but our interpretation. So one of the litmus tests that I always take is does my interpretation of salvation, grace, all of the things, walking in faith, if it contradicts the Torah, then I know my interpretation is wrong. And how do I know this philosophy works? Because that's what the writers of the Brit Hadashah did. They always brought you back to the Torah when they wanted to do an aspect or a revelation about the work of Yeshua. And so that's what we're all doing today in the book of Hebrews is the author is taking us back to Torah to institute and prove everything that Yeshua is doing in our lives today. And so I'm going to hand this over to Brother Mitch. We're going to go ahead here and uh, he'll open us up. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and dive into Hebrews chapter four to show you what we're talking about. Brother Mitch. Uh, thank you, Tony. And uh, good morning to everybody, uh, wherever you might be uh, watching this or whatever time uh, it might be and even whatever day it might be. Uh, but before we go ahead, uh, let's uh, open in a word of prayer. One of my favorite prayers, uh, Psalm 119.18, which would be very apropos. Agal ine viabita nifleot mitoratecha. Open our eyes that we would see wonderful things from your Torah. And also, um, just a general prayer. Uh, I'll pray it in Hebrew and then provide an interpretation so everybody uh, doesn't think I'm going crazy and speaking in tongues or whatever that really might not be. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech halam asher kedeshana b'mitzvot tov v'tzivanu la'asuk b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us to be engrossed in the words of your Torah. Baruch Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the blessed name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. So uh, one little tidbit um, before we'll get into Hebrews 4. Tony, you mentioned that the, the writers of the Brit HaDashah always uh, referred back to Torah or Tanakh, which leads me to ask this question, and this is something that I always ask uh, throughout Africa where I minister. Uh, the ministry is called African Messianic Outreach, AMO for short. <clears throat> and um, 
question is, so when Shaul, uh, the Apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, is writing 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and he says, all scripture, what does all scripture refer to in the context, in the time during which he was writing that in 2 Timothy? And you get a whole uh, hodgepodge of uh, different answers and those who are very well intended but extremely equally misinformed will always say well it's all the bible and then of course the question is well what do you mean by all of the bible and then the, the answer comes back well that would be all 66 books genesis through revelation and then what you have to do is you just have to say well wait a second uh, when was second timothy written and when did, in fact, the Brit Hadashah, what you refer to uh, commonly but errantly as the New Testament, and as we've discussed numerous times, there is no such thing as a biblical testament. But what do you mean by that? And they'll, they, they, don't, they don't know. And so here are the scriptures that comprise all scripture that Shaul is referring to when he penned 2 Timothy 3.16. Now, when we hear the word scripture today, it doesn't necessarily have the same meaning, the same understanding, the same uh, broad definition that we know it today. So that, that's number one. Number two, here are the three different things. Number one, there was a Torah that was still in circulation, but it was known as the Samaritan Pentateuch. Pente means five. We know this from Pentecost, which is really Shavuot. Okay. Uh, in Hebrew, it would be Chumash. And that's why we, we have uh, in synagogues, we have a Chumash that is widely available with the Torah portion and the Haftorah. So that's number one. Number two, you have the Targums. What are the Targums? I never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the Targums are the Aramaic translation, and that is what Targum means, translation. The Aramaic translation of what? The Aramaic translation of Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures. Remember or be reminded or perhaps this is the first time you're coming uh, into knowledge of this, Aramaic and Hebrew are cousins or sister languages. And th in, uh, different times in the Brit HaDashah, we see these funny words coming out of Yeshua's mouth. And it's like, what is this? Well, that's Aramaic. So we also know that uh, a portion of Daniel and Ezra was also written in Aramaic, which makes sense because where were they writing? Okay, sure. Daniel specifically in Babylon. Now, what? so we have the Samaritan Pentateuch, which is interesting. Why would there be the Torah from Samaria? <laughs> that, that always makes me chuckle. Okay, right. no, nothing good out of there. And Yeshua comes <laughs> to do what? To reconcile, restore, and to provide redemption, first and foremost, to the house of Israel, get this, and this is what many people don't understand, that was the original plan before, before what? Before his death, before his execution, before his burial, before his resurrection, and before his ascension. That all came, Matthew 10, come, came way before Matthew 28 and Acts 1-6 or Acts 1-8 and Romans 1-16, okay? So that's uh, number two. But what is number three? Number three would be what is commonly referred to as either the Septuagint or the LXX, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Those were the three scriptures that Shaul is referencing in 2 Timothy 3.16 when he writes, all scripture is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, and 17, that every man be thoroughly equipped for good work. Okay, so that, that's, that's the context here. So having said that, let's now go in at one other little point. So the, the anti-missionaries the, uh, or the counter-missionaries, uh, my uh, ethnic Jewish cousins uh, who deny Yeshua's messiahship and therefore will absolutely, totally reject his deity, will say, well, Yeshua started a brand new religion because... And one of the becauses, attempting to explain away Shaul, attempting to explain away Yeshua, is, well, you see, uh, those words don't uh, match up with Tanakh. Well, guess what? There was no Hebrew scriptures Tanakh in circulation back then. There was the LXX. There was the Septuagint. There was the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And that is why there are some words that are different but the whole meaning of the scripture doesn't change sure and this is where a lot of people get tripped up well it doesn't say this exactly and i can uh way back when when i'm first coming to faith this is pre-salvation there was um a, a a now brother who came up to me and said i i understand that you're interested in studying scriptures. And I know that you're Jewish. My mother was Jewish. My father wasn't, but you know, I, I'm Jewish. And I said, I agree. And he handed me Tanakh, a, the traditional JPS. And I had a Christian life Bible. And he said, when you're, when you're going, I know what you're going to do. You're going to compare verses from you, the Bible that you're reading back to the Tanakh. And what you're going to find for yourself is that there will be very little differences, but the whole thing means the same. And I said, oh, okay, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But then as I started to study messianic prophecy, and that's pretty much how all of us I'll call us old dogs who came to faith many, many years ago in the biblical Yeshua who were of uh, the Jewish persuasion or, or ethnic Jews. That's pretty much how we all came to faith. The verses from the English Bible. Going back to JPS, I could see that there was you know, a little slight difference in the wording, but the overall context was the same. And so it's just another one of the nonsensical arguments, attempted refutes that come up over and over and over again. And like all of them, they've all been soundly refuted soundly resoundingly refuted for over 2000 years now there as solomon wrote there is nothing new under the sun sure a lot of people will know that uh when they study the words of shaul one way you know that the lxx was uh considered god breathed to shaul is that is the one he mostly quotes from uh, exactly. when we're reading the brit hadashah so he knows he's talking to the diaspora he knows that they mainly read the LXX. And so that's what he's quoting from often over and over again. And so that's too where you might see some slight differences from uh, you know, the, uh, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text versus the LXX when you're reading well, the words of Paul. Exactly. Plus also, where was he from? He was from the diaspora. Yeah. yeah. Tarsus, so... so. He's, he's up in, uh, you know, up in Syria, up in there. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, without further ado, therefore, and as I learned many, many years ago, when you see therefore, it's always there for a reason. So wh why is this therefore here? Because it's a bridge of sorts. It's a continuing of a thought. Just think in, in uh, normal conversation today. 
you're, you're talking to somebody and you've uh, said a whole bunch of things. Uh, and then what do you say? Is it, and you, you've said this, and then you're going to make your point. You've laid the table, you've laid the foundation. And what do you say? Therefore, because of this, therefore, this. And this is kind of like what the writer, who I believe is Shaul, uh, is doing throughout the book of Hebrews. So he says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. What is the rest that he's referring to here? Is this the one day of a week Shabbat rest, or is this something completely different? I look at it as uh, the eternal rest that you will receive after you come face to face with Yah, after you come face to face with Yeshua. I mean, right now we're building the kingdom, working the kingdom. That entering the rest is when he basically says, enter in to, you know, the kingdom or enter into thy salvation, good and faithful servant. Um, that's from my perspective on how I see that. Well, exactly. And so let, let's just think now, who is he speaking to here? We, the book of Hebrews uh, is, well, obviously it's written to Hebrews or Jewish people. Um, you messianic Jews, if you like, and that would be appropriate as well. Uh, in the complete Jewish Bible, uh, the chapter, uh, that whole chapter or that whole book is referred to by Dr. Stern as messianic Jews. So uh, there's no issue with that. Uh, sure. Sadly, um, one of the facts that is uh, totally misunderstood is that there were no early Christians. Well, there were, but there weren't. But what I'm saying is the early believers were not Christians. The early believers were all Jews who understood through the biblical prophecies who Yeshua really was. But the leadership rejected him. It was the leadership that rejected his messiahship. It was the leadership that rejected his deity. Many of the people did not. Absolutely. There was a total messianic expectation during the time. Why? Because they understood the messianic prophecies. They understood the sign of the times. And what were they looking for? Yes, they were looking. They were all looking for a Messiah. They were all looking for a savior. They were all looking for a deliverer, but predominantly led by the leadership they were looking for the savior deliverer redeemer messiah who is going to redeem them deliver them save save them from the uh the greasy grimy grubby hands of rome sure. that's what they were looking for predominantly and they missed it and sad today leadership within judaism is doing the same thing well Just we can see them. we can see that they were delivered out of egypt by the angel of yah and now we know that that was yeshua so they received salvation they received the uh, covenant relationship right but that didn't exclude them now thinking they were in the rest like okay now we're in the rest we're standing at mount sinai we've gotten everything we've gotten the chains and the shackles taken off of us from egypt now we can rest no the work has just begun uh they now have to make it to the promised land uh and then that way i think that is the foreshadow of the rest that we will have what after we've done the kingdom Okay, well, let's continue with verse two. Uh, for indeed the gospel or for the good news was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, nor being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So what was the good news that was being preached to them? Let's break this down. Who was the them being referred to? Now, let's remember uh, let's not forget that Hebrews uh, 3 and chapter 4 through uh, verse 10 is a midrash on Psalm 95. 
okay? And as we went into it uh, last time very deeply, Psalm 95 uh, from verse six or seven uh, through the end 11. And it talks about, Hashem says, and I swore that they would not enter into my rest. I remember years ago when I was leading uh, Jewish ministry in a very predominant mega church here in South Florida. Uh, we had a, a once a month uh, meeting and it was basically an outreach uh, for Jewish people, et cetera. And I would always open up with Psalm 95 and I would hammer it. He swore they wouldn't enter into his rest. And you could see my, you know, you, you get to meet people beforehand, uh, you know, so forth and so on. And at, in that particular mega church, there were a lot of bringers people who would bring their Jewish friends and contacts or relatives at times to the meetings. So, um, you know, you get to know a little bit about people. And then as you're looking and you're standing in front of everybody, you could see the chagrin on people's faces. When you, what, what are you saying that God said that I could not enter into his rest? And it's like, and now from there, you jump off and you talk about what does that rest mean? And segueing and working your way through, going back to Jeremiah 31, 31, there is such a thing known as a new covenant. Mm -hmm. It's right here in our right. Bible. Okay. And it's like, oh my goodness, what did you bring me here for? Right. <laughs> you want to save me. <clears throat> no, that's the job of the Ruach. <laughs> but the good news that the Israelites first heard was the good news of the promise of entering into his rest in the promised land. Now, what's the good news that we've that has been proclaimed here in this time and even in our day? It's, of course, that we can enter into the rest that comes from knowing that our sins are forgiven by the one and only Redeemer, Deliverer, Messiah, Yeshua. Plain and simple. So there is, there can really not be if you are, and I, I use these words gingerly. I, I'm not trying to be condescending when I say it, but I say it to make a point, to wake people up. And that is, if you're being intellectually honest with yourself, I didn't call anybody dumb. I didn't call anybody stupid. I didn't say you were a fool. I'm just saying, if you're seriously intellectually honest, you have to come away with understanding that this is not the seventh day. This is eternal rest. Yeah. So this is a big takeaway from our friends in the in the western church who will always come back and say well, no i have eternal rest in yeshua well i don't judge salvation unless i see that you are blatantly denying yeshua and who he really is that that's a different topic but sure. we can tell pretty much uh, where somebody is coming from by what they continually write what they continually say okay we're, we're not judges of salvation. We're judges of the fruit. Sure. And there's a lot of rotten fruit that's out there. A lot of people that shouldn't be teaching at all. Well, Brother Mitch, he also, I mean, he made it real clear in verse 18 of chapter 3 that the reason why this particular group is not entering into the rest uh, out there in the wilderness is they did not obey. So there definitely is obedience in factor with your belief. Um, there is a connection there. Right. And, and I, I don't know uh, right now, I'll have to look it up later, but I'm believing that this word obey, if we go back uh, the English to the Greek to the Hebrew, I'll bet that it would be Shema. Oh, Listening. yeah, absolutely with yeah. comprehension and understanding to obey and ongoing obeying is obedience that's the absolutely. whole point oh yeah absolutely because like you were sharing uh, psalm 95 
you know, and you know how it, how the warning is not to harden your heart as in the rebellion. Well, if there's a rebellion, there's disobedience, which means you're not Shema. You're not, you know, you're not listening and obeying. Otherwise there would be no rebellion. Rebellion means you're not acting upon what you confessed or what you heard. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, okay. So let, we'll go into, so, uh, verse three, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said now quoting again from Psalm 95 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So what, what's, what's happening here? Um, you know, if we go to John uh, 5, 11, Yeshua says that you, let's see. Yeshua answered them and says, he who made me, well, um, this is the, the man. He, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and, and walk. Mm -hmm. So what do we find? We see that. I'm sorry, I read the wrong verse. It's verse 17. My eyes are uh, betraying me this morning. <laughs> but Yeshua answered them and said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Yeah, I love that verse. It, there's another, I believe, another proof text of Yeshua's deity. So, uh, verse four. Well, continuing with three. Uh, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So let's read it in totality. Verse three. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Again, quoting from Psalm 95, 11. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay, and there is the segue into uh, John 5, 17. Verse four, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in this place, verse five, they shall not enter my rest. Verse six, since therefore, Therefore, since, here we go again, therefore, he makes his point, and then he continues with a further explanation. Therefore, it remains that someone must enter it. Someone must enter what? Someone must enter the one day a week, seventh day, or someone must enter into what they, in disobedience, broke. That they, that he, Hashem, God, swore that they would not enter into his rest so let's just think logically let's bring the thoughts to its logical conclusion how could you possibly say although you can but does it make logical sense that this is talking about shabbat the one day seventh day a week or it is talking about <clears throat> something completely different which is a type of the seventh day. Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will uh, even, uh, you know, a lot of scholars today will recognize when they want to try and make that comparison of a day as a thousand years uh, to Yah. And they'll say, well, right now we're in the sixth day, you know, because we haven't hit the 7,000 years, you know, we're in the 6,000 years, seven. So we're in the sixth day now. Well, that makes a lot of sense because you're waiting for the seventh day, which it means that's the return of Yeshua. That's after, you know, uh, he has straightened out the earth and, and it's, you know, been redone and re, uh, we got new heavens and new earth. We now enter into that seventh millennium uh, where we now enter into rest with Yahweh as he did uh, rested from his work on the seventh day. Uh, there he ceased from his work. Well, Again, we are all working the kingdom right now. So we are, it, we're still in the sixth day is, is how I like to put it. Uh, yeah, very, very, very true. And I, I've heard it said um, a little bit more pointedly 
is that when we understand the overall plan that there are seven days of creation and each day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. And <clears throat> that's a combination of um, Isaiah and uh, Peter's writings, but the rabbinical mm -hmm. it also, which comes after, cements it. And I believe if I'm remembering correctly, it's from Sanhedrin 98, a, it's either A or B, I forget which off the top of my head right now, but it says this, the age of man is 6,000 years, 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of Messiah. So it's like, wow, wait a second, what, what does that really mean here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then um, as I've also heard, and this makes perfect sense to me, when we come to that particular understanding, then we know that we're somewhere in the, in the sixth day. And as we understand uh, actual biblical prophecy, because we have the sure prophetic word, not some garble garble that somebody had a dream, and now they're giving their private interpretation. Um, I'm not talking about words of knowledge i know that there are words of knowledge but let's not get carried away with all of these prophetic stuff that people just jump on the bandwagon um and get carried away with trying to interpret every little thing that happened in today's news and wrapping it and tying it back into the bible that's nonsense that's totally unbalanced theology sure right how how can we say that if we understand the things that are going on in the world today then we we can see that we're getting close now we're not date setting but if you attempted to put it on the clock you would be somewhere around the the sixth day the 11th hour and somewhere in the 59th minute maybe 30 seconds maybe the 59 second but the clock has stopped it's still going to move because eventually the clock has to line up to the seventh day at midnight boom and then bingo what happens so that's kind of like how it all fits in on our clock today i didn't say the biblical day which i know starts at sundown, okay, let's let's be clear, I'm talking about bringing it into some type of a way that we could normally understand how our time system works in the world that we live in. Even though we are in the world, we're not of the world. So picking back up. <clears throat> Okay. Verse so six. Verse, since therefore, here we go again, therefore. How many times has therefore been there already? I think that's three. <laughs> right. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. What is the it that some must enter? Enter into salvation because that day is still available, because that day is still promised. Today, or all people who are ever going to come to faith in the biblical Yeshua, have they already come to faith? So, well, Mitch, that's a crazy question. You already answered it yourself. Exactly. The answer is no, they haven't. Will people still continue to come to faith? Yes, they will. Amen. <clears throat> Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. They heard, they didn't obey, they didn't comprehend, they didn't listen with comprehension and understanding, or they just totally rejected the message. I love, uh, I love how the author repeats himself a couple <laughs> times, but yet changes the wording, but says the same thing. I mean, this for me is something that, you know, I didn't know was Hebraic or I didn't know it was a Jewish 
way of speaking until, you know, I really began to see the pattern. I mean, in verse two, he makes it very clear that they heard the message, but it didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with faith. Well, you know, in Western Christianity, we think of faith as just belief, like, oh, I just got to believe. But then he says it again down here where Brother Mitch just said, well, you know, it was preached to them first, but they were disobedient. Well, so again, faith has to do with not just belief, but also obedience. There's, there's a balance there. Yep. And uh, Tony, you just confirmed that you were not grown up. You, you didn't um, grow up in my house. Nope, I did not. <laughs> nope. No, and, my, and uh, my lineage doesn't go back to Jacob. Uh, well, so. what I'm saying is that uh, in my family, uh, oh. and mother learned it from my father, who learned it from his father, is that, and, and I've carried it as well. And that is this, very simply, is that I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to tell you what I've already told you. And then I'm going to tell you again to make sure that you understood it. <laughs> yep, yep. So it's like a piece of bread, okay? And I use this analogy a lot, is here you have a piece of bread, and you're going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So what do you do? You either use the jelly first, you spread it all the way around, making sure you covered each and every crevice in all of the corners of the bread. And then you put on either, secondly, the peanut butter or the jelly and making sure that you covered all of it. And then you do the same thing with the other piece of bread. And now you have your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You cover mm -hmm. whole thing, making certain that you were totally heard in its context and that there is absolutely no way that you could come away from this conversation, I didn't understand what you said. Well, you weren't listening. Right. That's it. You turned me off. You didn't like the message. You might not have liked the messenger too. But anyway, so here we go. Verse seven. And again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Psalm 95, verse 7 and 8. Yeah. So he's, you know, the, this verse uh, 7 repeats today. It's the theme uh, going back to uh, last week, uh, chapter seven, uh, chapter three, verse seven, 13 and 15. How many times have we heard, we've read, we've seen today. And yep. now he's picking it back up, continuing the thought and just hammering it home. Now he goes on in verse eight. For if Yehoshua, that Joshua, had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, here, you know, some, well, you know, it says uh, Joshua, that's not Yeshua. Well, actually, uh, the, the Greek name, and we can get into all of this, uh, which sometimes gets convoluted, but uh, Yehoshua, uh, the, the Greek would be Jesus. It's the same as the Greek word for Yeshua. Uh, and sadly, uh, we get into a whole bunch of uh, errant theology of the sacred namers that have to have Yah in everything. Yah sure. can be in some things as long as it is a, not a prefix, but a suffix, because that's how Hebrew language works. It's the basic rules of Hebrew grammar. Because... Mm -hmm. I know what you're going to say, my sacred name, friends. It says hallelujah. Yeah, but where did the yah come? Before or after the hallelujah? <clears throat> okay, enough of that. Let's continue. So therefore, verse 9, here, here he goes again. <laughs> it remains therefore. That's four times already. And in nine verses, four times, therefore. Therefore, a rest for the people of God. 
Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So what is Brother Mitch, the, Brother Mitch, in uh, verse nine, where it says uh, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God, uh, would not the, since we're standing here, uh, this is probably being preached in a Jewish synagogue to the Jewish people. I mean, my thinking is they know the context. They know when he says people of God, he's talking about the nation of Israel. I mean, I know in Western Christianity, they're just going to think the Christians, the people of God are, is the church, the Christians, but the covenant is with Israel. And so Israel has this mission of being a light to the nations. And so they obviously are not going to be allowed to fully enter into that rest until they've accomplished their mission, don't you think? I, I would agree. Yeah. I, I would agree. Uh, there, there's something really interesting in verse 10. So let's continue there and then we'll okay. uh, it up a little bit. So for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So this is talking about a combination of things. This is talking about not only salvation, but is also talking about the seventh day Shabbat. Now, how do we know that? Well, there, um, the, there's a Greek word that's in this verse, verse 10. I'm sorry, it's in verse nine, uh, which is used one time, one time only in the Brit HaDashah. And it's the Greek word, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and my transliteration of Greek is not that great. Uh, let me try it again. Sabatzien. S-A-B-B-A-T-I-Z-E-I-N. So, so it was coined to translate the Hebrew verb Shabbat when it means to observe Shabbat. But the usual translation, there remains a Sabbath rest, minimizes the observance of Shabbat, the seventh day, and makes the role of God's people completely, entirely passive. Now, this goes on to how we kind of opened up this whole discussion regarding our friends in the Western church, and that is that our uh, brothers and sisters who are of the Western church theology and denominational doctrine often assume that the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, doesn't require God's people to observe Shabbat. And then they go on to claim that Sunday has replaced Saturday or Shabbat as the church day of worship. And we can see this in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. But this particular passage, and in particular verse 9, shows that Sabbath observance is expected of believers. How, sure. else, how else do we know this, Tony? How else do we know there still remains? Um, you're talking about the Sabbath? Right. Well, I'm talking about the 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 conflict of the seventh day versus the first day what why so how would we know that god all of god's people um well let me do it the other way that our brothers and sisters christians mm -hmm. often assume that the bible doesn't require god's people to observe shabbat the seventh day but go on to claim that Sunday has replaced Saturday Shabbat, Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown through Havdalah as the church day of worship. W what particular verse might you be drawn to or could we bring somebody to to have them understand that this was never so? Sure, well, I usually, I mean, I usually take them to Matthew chapter five, verses 17 through 19 and ask them, has everything been fulfilled? 
uh, they typically will try and say yes, that Yeshua fulfilled everything. And then I would ask them, well, why is he returning a second time if he fulfilled everything? Uh, obviously, he hasn't fulfilled everything. And so the law of Moshe is still you know, valid for all of us today. Uh, the other thing that I go to, too, is I just talk about the 10 words. Uh, obviously, we can go to Exodus 20 and uh, begin to talk about the 10 words. And we know that they're not interpreted as commandments, but words, utterances, uh, which for you know, my understanding is eternal. They are being uttered. They share the, the very um, nature of who Yahweh is because we are made in his image. We are to walk in that image. Well, he gave us the 10 words so that we can bear his image, so we can express his image. So all 10 need to be studied to see how uh, they reflect the image of Yahweh, which Yeshua is the word made flesh. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I can go on and on. I, I think the 10 words were intertwined in the fabric of creation uh, to be a part of creation, which, of course, you've got the fourth, uh, the fourth word being Shabbat. Shabbat uh, is a reflection of the eternal rest that we will have in Yahweh. Uh, also, for me, it's connected right there with Genesis 1.14 where you know it talks about how the uh, stars and the planets uh, basically the sun and moon were created for a sign all right signs there um and it talks about seasons in 114 the word seasons is moedim these are the appointed times mm -hmm. and so all the appointed times look to, uh, and prove the work of yeshua both his death resurrection, the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, and his second coming. So all eight of the appointed times in Leviticus 23 are still ongoing because they point to the work of Yeshua. I mean, yeah, I, I know I'm kind of rambling on here, but boy, when you when you asked that question, I had just like a flood of, uh, <laughs> a flood of things come into my mind. It's like, uh, it just doesn't make any sense that you would try to ignore the Sabbath and replace it uh, when, you know, the resurrection of Yeshua happened on a particular appointed time. You know, the first barley harvest, he chose that day for his appointed time. So he didn't say or command to do that every week or whatnot. Now, if you want to create a tradition where you celebrate his resurrection every Sunday, that's fine. But that's a tradition that's not a Torah command. It, it should never negate a command of Yah, you know. So I guess I'm still rambling here. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. And uh, so and, and now what we and this is a joke for those of us, for those people who don't really know us that well. Um, I, again, uh, you have confirmed that you are part of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> I know so, you asked for one verse, and I think I gave you about five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've been accused, and rightfully so, of having that in the mouth many times. Um, that's because when you, and I, I've said this often, and this is another one of my corny jokes, is that you never give a preacher a microphone. <laughs> it, yep. it, it, it's bad, you know. Uh, anyway, but let's go back to Matthew 5.17. Okay. To look at it just in a, a different light. So we know it says, do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So many in the Western church say, well, you see, Yeshua fulfilled it. Therefore, it's not for today. So let's take that, just that thought, sure. just seeing with Matthew 5, 17. So what you're saying then is really, logically, you're saying that Yeshua actually said, do not think that I came to uh, not fulfill the law or the prophets. I did not come to fulfill the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill the law or the prophets. Huh? Right. What? Well, it, it makes no sense. Sure. Okay. But the, the verse that I would go to um, is I, I always try to take people back to the beginning. And I'm not talking about Genesis here, uh, the book of the beginnings, Bereshit, but I'm talking about when did Gentiles 
those who were basically had no faith at all, they were pagans, they were barbarians. When did th that was a major concern or a concern and issue in the emerging body of Messiah? We uh, go Acts back. 15. Acts 15. Yep. And what was part of the edict? We're not talking about the four necessary. Now read it carefully. It says the, there are four things that are necessary. It doesn't, these are the basics. That's what it means. These are the essentials. It doesn't stop there, but it says what? I'm gonna read it specifically directly from the New King James, Acts 15, verse 21. Everybody should highlight this, underline it, mark it in your Bible. For Moses had throughout many generations those who preached him in every city, being read in the synagogues every first day of the week? I don't think so. Right. Every Shabbat. So what was, let's break this down. What was it that is being preached in the synagogues on every Shabbat? Moses. Well, what does that really refer to? What did Yeshua say on the Emmaus road when he opened their eyes to full understanding? And beginning at Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, he's mentioning each separate compartment, if you will, of the Tanakh. Sure. Well, Moses, Psalms, it's the first book of the writings, the Ketuvim, and the prophets, the Nebuim, T and K. So I go back there. So how would somebody who first came to biblical faith in the God of Israel, Yeshua, who was executed, who was buried, who was resurrected, who was ascended, who gave instructions to, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What were, what was the edict? What was the final edict of the Jerusalem Council? It yeah, was. They would show okay. up on Shabbat to hear, to hear now, the law of Moshe. Yeah, exactly. How would this apply to today for those who are in the Western church? Those that are in the church, people are coming to faith. In, in the biblical Yeshua, okay? The, they have a faith in Yeshua. We're not gonna argue or get involved with doctrine at this point. They have a faith, they have biblical faith. They understand who Yeshua is, okay? Bingo, the basics. Mm -hmm. What was, what would, what would those in the church say? To someone who said, well, I don't know anything. Well, keep on coming back. When, well, when should I come back? Well. We have worship service one day a week, and we have a midweek Bible study. And if you keep on coming back, you're going to become what? You'll become discipled. It's the same basic principle. Sure. I mean, even, even within the uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, writings and that, they fully admit that there's nowhere in the Brit Hadashah, New Covenant, where Yah uh, actually, or Yeshua, uh, or any of the writers, uh, were told to forsake Shabbat, that Shabbat exactly. was, was now done away with. This is an extra biblical teaching made up by the traditions of men 400 years later. Uh, and, and exactly. Yep. And not a vote as are found in the Amidah which is completely different. Okay, yep. and for those of you who uh, don't necessarily understand what I just said, there's a, a daily prayer that's called the Amidah, it's the standing prayer. And um, religious Jews will say the Amidah um, every day, uh, yep. some three, three, day, three times a day. But in ev regardless of how many times a day, and regardless of whether or not you're saying the Amidah daily, at least on Shabbat, you will say, you will stand, which 
Amida, and you will recite that prayer. And the first section of the Amida is called Avot. It's the fathers. That's what Avot means. So we're talking about the fathers of the faith, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to whom he appeared physically and personally, to whom he gave the promises, gave it first to Abraham, confirmed it to Isaac, and then reconfirmed the very same promises back to Jacob. Amen. That's the Avot. <clears throat> so, um, verse 10, we're still in here. So, we, you know, we can, so this is talking about not just uh, salvation, salvation which only comes from the biblical Yeshua, but also of the seventh day of week, the Shabbat rest or Sabbath keeping. So um, again, so uh, our brothers and sisters who are in the church, again, they will have a incorrect understanding that God doesn't, uh, or that the Brit uh, HaDashah, the New Testament, doesn't require uh, them or people to observe Shabbat, but they go on and claim that Sunday has replaced Saturday as the church day of worship. So we know if we go back and we read the writings of the church fathers, now I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about the body of Messiah, making a distinction. I did not say, and I do not believe that the church has replaced Israel. I do not believe, and I did not say that there's two separate entities, a church and Israel. Right. I'm saying, I'm making a distinction lingu uh, linguistically so that people can understand that those who are in the church and hold to church theology and denominational doctrine will come to this errant understanding that somehow Shabbat has been replaced. That's what I said. Do not misconstrue it. So, in a particular, we see in verse 9 that the Sabbath observant is actually expected of all believers. And now we, we can go into Colossians 2, uh, verse 16 and 17, which is a very interesting one that gets convoluted as well, which says that Sabbath was a shadow of the things uh, that were to come, but the substance comes from Messiah. So what do we learn from that? We learn that the essence of Sabbath observing for believers is not following the detailed rules, which halakha or traditional Jewish law or halakha means a walking or the way um, sets forth concerning what may or may not be done on the seventh day of the week. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. And here's something else that's very interesting. When you look at the 39 different reasons or different things that you are not to do on Shabbat, according to Halakha, you'll find that each and every one of them refers to the tabernacle. Sure. So that, that's something else that's like, wow. Okay, but we can take principles. I, I get that. We can take principles. But what should Shabbat, what should the seventh-day Shabbat really be all about? And for me, it, it should be that for six days a week, we're doing our normal thing, whatever, whatever that activity might be. When it comes to Shabbat, what we should do, what we should attempt to do the best way that we can, and it starts with taking itty bitty baby steps and then taking bigger steps and bigger steps. And it's up to every individual personally to do this is you understand what you were doing on the six days and then little by little, you don't do them. Right. 
Okay. So I know it's difficult and I'm not saying that I do them because I know I don't. And I'd be a hypocrite to say that I do, but you attempt to do or to leave out to cut off those things that you were doing during the six days and to focus the one day it's not just rest it's not just oh well i don't work on shabbat that's part of it but it's resting it's resting in him it's focusing on him that is what shabbat observance is really all about so sure and me, in, in ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 Yah particularly says, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us so they would know that I am the Lord who made them holy, who made them a set apart people. And that is perfectly lines up with what Yeshua has done in our lives. He has made us holy. He has made us set apart. So in no way do I think he would take away Sabbath observance if as a matter of fact, we should be doing it more than ever because we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in us because of the work of Yeshua. And it is a sign that he has made us holy. I just think that's powerful. Yeah, uh, th that's real good. And so let's continue with verse 10 a little bit more. So um, it doesn't mean to, uh, you know, it's not following the, the detailed rules of uh, Halakha that are set forth as to uh, what can or can't be done on the seventh day, but rather, uh, I believe verse 10 explains that the uh, Shabbat keeping uh, expected of all of God's people consists of resting, ceasing from our own individual works as God did from his. Amen. I think that makes perfect sense. That would sure. line up with scripture. It consists of trusting and being faithful to him. And now we go back to verse uh, two and three. So now we, we can get into some uh, other things here, uh, but you know, the specific works uh, that, from which the the readers of this letter uh, were to rest from were to be the animal offerings the daily offerings we see this in uh, hebrews uh chapter six verses uh four through six so it, it comes down to really um a, a an individual struggle so what, what are we relying on? Are we relying on our own efforts or are we trusting in God? Amen. Okay. And this is the same point that Shaul makes in Romans 3 in a very long section of scripture from Romans 3.19 through 4.25. So now we have verse 11. Uh, so here we come again. Uh, uh, let us. Okay. Therefore, that's five in mm -hmm. 11 verses. Five therefores. He continues to hammer home the point. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of what? Of disobedience. Yeah, and he's already talking to people who are in Yeshua. So if if you are in Yeshua and you have this so-called rest and you don't need to uh, do Sabbath because you can rest in Yeshua, this would have been a perfect opportunity to make that clear. But he doesn't because that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that future rest in the future, though you have Yeshua right now. You're in the kingdom right now, but be diligent. Be diligent to have focus on heading towards the high calling that you've received, that high calling of walking in obedience to, you know, obviously to keep going in the race. You're in the race now and you need to finish the race. 
Exactly. And we, we can see here how he continues to use the word therefore and bring it back to Psalm 95, which is the, the source, uh, the basis of this whole section of scripture in Hebrews mm -hmm. 3 and 4. Yep. That, you know, what is today? What is this rest? Uh, what happens when you do not enter into this rest? And why is there a day that is called today as long as there is today? That, that, so, which leads us to one of the most quoted verses in the entire Bible. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and the heart is deceitfully wicked above all says adonai jeremiah 17 9. so he brings them right back to walking in obedience and how do we walk or know even what obedience is how do we even know what sin is it's through the torah for the word of god is living and powerful so the word of torah obviously yeshua proved it's not just ink on a uh, on a parchment or manuscript or whatnot it's uh not just something written on stone but yeshua living it out showed that it is uh, uh it is living when you engage in obedience to what has been written on stone or written on scrolls it now becomes alive uh, and it becomes powerful because it's showing you how to love. It's showing you how to love Yah with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's showing you how to love your neighbor as yourself. Exactly. And yeah, I, I could go into a whole bunch of other uh, you know, rabbinic discourses, but I, I won't. Um, so now we come to verse um, 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Wow. wow. So and not, notice he doesn't say, you know, and I'm just talking about the moral law of God. You know what I mean? He's not trying to break it down into three different uh, <laughs> categories here. When he talks about the word of God is living, he's talking about the whole thing. Exactly. I'm thinking of uh, trying to find it here. Psalm 139. Um, well, there, basically, wh where can we go? Um, where, how, where can we go to hide from you? We, we can't go anywhere. Right. King David said that, didn't he? Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, you know exactly where we are. You know exactly what we're thinking. And you know what we would, what we are thinking before we even thought it. Sure. Wow. And, and some want to reduce this magnificent, majestic Messiah into a mere man who is a, a messenger. And it's like, wow. So verse 14. So seeing that we have a great high priest, a Kohen Hagadol, who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have I Cohen Hagadol, a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of our need. Amen. Verse 15. 
Yep. This is uh, this is definitely a verse I go to to let people know because you know we've talked about in the past, brother Mitch, uh, that there was a uh, original sin, but the doctrine of original sin uh, will not line up with this scripture on how the doctrine is preached because they want to say that you and I, uh, brother Mitch, were born already corrupted sinners from birth. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we've lived out this depraved, you know, we were born depraved and so forth. Well, then you would have to say Yeshua was born a guilty sinner and depraved because he can sympathize with our weaknesses and he was tempted in all ways uh, as we were tempted. So he would not be able to relate to us if, uh, you know, we were born these depraved sinners and he wasn't. Right. So. Mm -hmm. That's where we know and understand that we are all born innocent and sinless, but we became sinners. He never did. So he can sympathize with us because he was born like us. He came in flesh like us, uh, but yet he conquered what we could not do. Exactly. Um, I, I'm also thinking that uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, Hmm. Uh, yep. a very often uh, quoted scripture, uh, which is translated really bad. Uh, it says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Hmm. He didn't become sin. He, he, he can't become sin. It's, it's right. just, you know, if you think he's a man, then he could become sin. But, and you're entitled to your own wrong opinion. But you then, if you hold to that view, you do not have, sadly, you do not have the biblical Yeshua. You, you just don't. I, I, I can't stress it enough. But what, what am I saying? What would be the proper rendering of that verse? It should really read, and you might want to add this. Uh, it's one of the places that we should put a little um, note in our Bibles and circle it or underline it. Uh, boldly, that he who knew no sin became the sin offering for us. Yep. Amen. That's how it should properly be rendered. Amen. And so, as we close out uh, this section and our time uh, together with uh, chapter four, uh, we're, we're leading into. Uh, what we had initially thought we would start off with, as many times we do, yeah. uh, we have a thought, and then as we read it, we say, you know what, <laughs> we set the table. <laughs> so uh, we'll continue uh, next time with chapter five and the high priest, the qualifications of the high priest, uh, the high priesthood. Well, let's go back a little bit to verses 12 and 13. So he climaxes this entire chapter, if you will, uh, chapter four, with verses 12 and 13. And what's happening is that if you really read it uh, in fear and, and awe, then you'll understand that how we should come away from this is really terrified of Hashem's judgment not be terrified of him, not be fearful of him, but that, that's a whole different, we hear we fear and we hear words and we take them to mean what they mean today and they, we don't, we take them out of their biblical context. So it's not being fearful of him, but right. I know for a fact what it is to stand before a judge, a federal judge in a federal courtroom. That is fearful that is that's horrific mm -hmm. and i remember as i'm talking about this i still remember my knees shaking and i couldn't stop them and i had a time to speak after the sentencing it's called allocution i couldn't open up my mouth afterwards my uh, my mother and father were there and uh, they, they kind of joked with me and they said, you know, for the one time in your life, you had nothing to say. <laughs> so I, I said, well, I, I really couldn't say anything 
uh, and they they um, they asked me, "Did you notice that your knees were shaking?" And I said, "I felt them, but I didn't notice them." And I said, "Well, we saw and we knew that you were going to not be able to say anything." Which, by the way, my brother-in-law, who was my attorney at the time, told me that there would be a point uh, during this hearing where I came specifically to plead out, to accept my guilt, to accept the verdict, um, that I would have a chance to speak. And he said, trust me, you're not going to be able to say a thing. And I, I poo-pooed him, but he, he was right. So how much more? Mm -hmm. Standing before a judge in a federal courthouse True. where sentencing is being rendered upon your life. And for me, it was 10 months in a federal prison camp. It's an old story. I'm not going to get into it. But how much more standing before the righteous God? Amen. And as we've said many, many times, we echo Shaul much more so much more so he reassures us though that even though yeshua will one day be our judge now he is our intercessor and he is our advocate Absolutely. in 725 and first john 2 1 but therefore and here we go again therefore therefore because he is our high priest our kohen uh, Hagadol as well as our future judge, let us approach him to his throne of grace to find grace in our time of need. And if Brother Mitch, you don't mind, go to um, Matthew chapter 11, because before we end, this is one of the verses that is given to me oftentimes when studying this chapter four. Uh, talking about the Sabbath and not having to do it because uh -huh. our our rest is in Yeshua. This would be the other verse that they go to, and it's in Matthew, Matiyahu, uh, 11. I'm sorry, 11. Uh, and it is uh, verses 28 and 29. Okay. Uh, where Yeshua says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so they seize upon that term rest, and they're like, see, our rest is in Yeshua. We don't need Shabbat anymore. Uh, we just rest in him, uh, and we follow after him. So what are your, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on these verses here? Okay. Well, first of all, he's talking about the, uh, the yoke of discipleship. That's, that's first and foremost. Amen. And yet the rest that he's speaking of um, relates to salvation. <clears throat> and so, you know, okay, so 28, 29, uh, and it also goes into 30. Come to me, all you who are, lab who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So this is talking about, really, uh, Shaul later on in Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, what I call the holy trifecta, uh, expands, I believe, a little bit more upon Yeshua's words. And Yeshua here is speaking specifically about salvation. He's said, come to me. Sure. What did, what did he do? How, what was the word that he used? Or what were some of the words that he used when he called the original 12? In Hebrew, it would be both. Come, right. yep. come. Now, let's just stay with that for a little bit. So come to me. He is calling all of us to come to him. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're a bondman or a free. All is all and all means all in every single language of the world. 
even if it's a an undiscernible language that you've never heard before. It still means all. So this is universal. All you who labor and are heavy laden, where what does labor entail? Labor entails work. Yep. All you who are working and are heavy laden, when we work, we're putting a burden on ourselves. Now, some of us have easy jobs. I get it. Uh, when, when I am working, and I will go back to work shortly, I work on the telephone. For me, it's easy. I've done it for over 15, uh, 20 years or so. It's a piece of cake. I love talking, and especially on the phone. <laughs> part of it's because I'm you know, part of a preacher. But right. uh, anyway, what he says, you who work, who are laboring and are heavy laden, what is he referring to? He's referring to all of the different ways that we attempt to earn our salvation, which is works. It's all works. And then he says, I will give you rest. What is the rest that he's giving? He's giving rest from our work, rest from our self, and rest, and more importantly, rest for our souls Amen. eternal rest this is this rest again is the outworking of the seventh day because the seventh day is when you're looking at it closely and you understand the meaning of the hebrew it is a moed which means it's an appointed fixed determined time to be in his presence it's a command that's right Genesis 2 3. It is Shabbat is blessed and it's holy. And now we jump into Exodus 20. What does it say? We are to remember the Shabbat and the same Hebrew word to keep it holy. Sanctified and holy is the Hebrew word, the same Hebrew word, Kadosh. So it's the outworking of it, but there's two other Hebrew words that relate to Shabbat that I've missed. In the English, it says holy convocation. So holy, we know, Kodes, big deal, okay, la, 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 let's move on. But convocation, sometimes it says assembly, depending upon the translation or the version that you're reading. The Hebrew word for convocation or assembly is mikre. And mikra can mean, and in the context does mean a rehearsal. Yep. So what is Shabbat? It's a holy rehearsal for what? Think with me. We know without a clue, regardless of whether you are in the Western church theology and denominational doctrine or not, or whether or not you are Torah observant. You're following the best that you can in a messianic lifestyle. You understand totally that there is a future Shabbat, and that is the millennial kingdom. But when does that happen? So that's something future. Now, hear me loud and clear. And I, I've used this example many times before. It's a, apropos again today. Is there's a um, pick a sport, it's football season. So what happens, um, high school, they play either uh, Friday night or Saturday. Uh, college will play on Saturday or Thursday night, sometimes Friday night now with ESPN. You, you never know. It used to be <laughs> Friday, right. Saturday, Sunday. Well, it used to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now it could be any day of the week, um, but specifically, so, and the pros are predominantly Sunday, and now we have Monday night. We also have Thursday, too. But removing that day, what I'm saying is that there's a game coming up. We know who we're going to be playing next or this coming game. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for the game? We are practicing. What is sure. practice? This is rehearsal. When you are 
going to be in a play, whether it's on Broadway or off Broadway, whether it's in your local school or not, you have a rehearsal for the big day. It's the same thing here. What is Shabbat? Shabbat is the one day of the week, the seventh day, not the first day. It is the seventh day of the week that is the rehearsal. And guess what? In his infinite wisdom, he gives us one day a week to rehearse for the grand finale. That's right. How mm -hmm. much more, if we get the wrong day, currently in our lifetime, will we be ill-prepared for the big event? Shaul would reply, much more. Yeah. Couldn't agree yeah, with I you more. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that, Brother Mitch. I was I was definitely thinking along the same lines, but that was an excellent, uh, uh, excellent explanation. I mean, it doesn't get much plainer than that. So, so I think that, you know, many times for us, uh, because we've been walking it, we've been doing it, we've been teaching it, it, it somehow becomes not necessarily second nature, but it becomes so plain, so clear, so crystal clear that it's unmistakable. But yet what we need to do, we need to remember that at one point in our life, it wasn't that way. Right. I agree. So yeah, absolutely. What we need to do is we need to demonstrate the grace for those who don't who don't have the full revelation yet absolutely so yeah. how how do we do how do we overcome how do we attempt to encourage those who do not have that full revelation well there's only one way that i know of maybe somebody else can offer uh something else up what i do and specifically i do this with those that i am in some form of discipleship mentoring process with, they'll ask a question and I will always refer them back to scripture. Yeah. What does the scripture say? What does it say? They'll come back with an answer. And I'll say, if, if they're not giving the correct answer, I'll just keep on bringing them back to scripture. Why do I do that? It's something that is done here in the book of Hebrews, specifically in chapters three and four, he's laid it. I'm going to tell you what I, I'm going to tell you. Now I've told you. Now I'm going to tell you again what I've just told you. Yep. This is basic stuff. Yep. I, I, there's many different ways. Don't get me wrong. There's many different ways. But I have found in my life that this is a very effective way for those who will not become discouraged because they believe errantly you're not helping them, number one, and number two, that you're not giving them the answer. My response is, is it better that I teach you how to fish for yourself or continue fishing for you? Right. That's a major and difference. Also, in part, the way that I was raised up was by always asking questions. And my mentors, my early mentors, and even those today, will many times, well, early, they would never give me the answer because I they knew that I needed to dig it out. So they would help me and they would say, well, you know, read so-and-so. And I would go there and I would read it and I would have more questions. And they loved it because they understood that I followed their instruction. I was at least attempting to learn sure. whatever understanding I may have had. And then I asked more questions. And this is similar, but in a different approach to what you and I, Tony, are doing in this format, a Jew and Gentile discuss. Yeah. We are taking what we know to be true, not because we want it to be true, not because we think it's true. But because it is true, absolute truth, and we're just looking at all of the different possible responses that people can come up with, and we're saying, well, 
uh, that's okay. But what about this? What about this? What about this? What right. about this? That's the balanced approach that you and I come when we uh, come with when we are uh, teaching uh, throughout the Bible. Amen. Amen. So as we wrap this up here today, I hope this was very beneficial for you. I know it was even more helpful to me too. It's, it's always is as we go over this over and over again. Uh, um, just talking with one another, kind of like what Brother Mitch says, when you're asking questions, not only can we have one way of saying things, but we can figure out other ways of saying the same thing that can help people because you know what? There's not just one way that everyone's going to get it, right? There, You have to be able to, that's why we have different preachers. That's why we have different people who can reach others. Not one person can reach everybody. So we need to have these discussions. We need to talk about the different ways people see things in the scriptures uh, so that we can learn various ways how to share the gospel message of Yeshua to everybody. Amen. So very powerful time, Brother Mitch. Uh, we are going to, uh, again, try our best to keep coming at you uh, every Wednesday and, and recording this and then shipping it out to you guys. Please, again, as Brother Mitch has said several times, don't be afraid to put questions on my YouTube channel or when he's posting them in his various places and groups. Please ask the questions and uh, we will do our best to, if we don't have the answer, we will find it. We will go search it out and find it. Uh, others we know can be very helpful. And so we'll, we're always bouncing things off of others too. Amen. 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 All right. So let's go ahead and end in prayer uh, today. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and honor, thanking you for your word, thanking you, Lord, that you never abandon us, that Yeshua and the Holy Spirit are right here with us always. Uh, we continue to lift up Uganda right now. There's many things going on in Uganda that the people are going through. Father, you know exactly their situation. We lift up grace to you right now, Father, for healing, that you would continue to minister to her heart, that her faith would be trusting in you, and that the answers would come to those around her and to herself, Lord. We know that you are comforting her right now. And we pray that the healing touch of the Holy Spirit will heal her. Father, thank you so much for your word and our time together. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 So until we meet again, everyone. Shavu Vatov. Shavu Vatov.